And here we go again, graph of the intensity now as a function of beta. So we're basically graphing that top function that we had before. And this is what we get. We get this central really bright maximum, the this minimum just to the side here when beta is equal to pi. And then we get these other, this off, these fringe bright maximums, these fringe bright spots, and then another dark spot, bright spot, dark spot. But those fringes are all very dim relative to the central peak. And in a lot of these diagrams, or the, a lot of the graphs here, just to note that the, the plot, the vertical axis, is the intensity relative to the peak intensity. All right, so hard stuff mostly out of the way. Let's look at an example and use some of that uh, hard plot information. Okay, we have a uh, light wavelength 550 nanometers passing through a slit uh, with two micrometers and produces a diffraction pattern shown here. Uh, find the location of the first two minima in terms of that angle from the central maximum and then determine the intensity relative to the central maximum at a point halfway between those uh, angles. All right, so we're talking about the minimums first in A. So we can just go back to our uh, destructive condition for that single slit inter, uh, diffraction. So what is minimums one, first minimum, then equals two, the second minimum. So let's see for that first one, first sign of one, it was one, 550 nanometers, or times 10 to the minus 9 meters over the slit width, two micrometers, or two times 10 to the six meters. All that gives you about 16 degrees. So that's the first angle, the angle of the first minimum. Second one, just plugging in the same stuff except for n is 2, we get 33.4 degrees. Right. So what about, now we want to see what's the intensity right in the middle of those two. So the middle will just be add one. Uh, turns out to be 24.7 degrees. Uh, 24. So that's the angle, right? And our equation, we could put it directly into the equation where uh, the intensity was a function of angle. Just going to do an intermediate one where figure out what beta is and then put that in. So maybe simpler. You can do it either way. That's beta in terms of theta. And putting some of these values in, putting all these values in. This is the angle of that uh, right between the first and second minimum. All that divided by the wavelength. That's going to end up being 4.77 radians, right? or about one and a half, 1.25 times pi, or 1.25 pi. So then, what's the intensity relative to the peak intensity? Well, we're looking at it like that, then it's just this. sine beta over beta squared. Turns out that is 0 0.044, or, you know, about 4%. So intensity right in the middle of the two first minimums, about 4% which uh, is very close to what we got for the 
intensity of the first maximum when we're adjusting about phasers and wrapping phasers around until we get to um, from minimum to maximum, right? Where we get that diameter of the circle they're creating. So there's your sort of cooperating results here, right? They should be similar, right? Between the first two minimum is about where the first maximum is. So thinking about just that central maximum a little bit for a second here, it's sort of bounded by those uh, first minimum, right? Where the light dies off entirely just around that central peak. Right? That's the width of that central or that center peak. And the destructive condition tells us that if A, if you, that you change that slit width, then sine of theta also has to change. Right? If A is getting larger, then sine of theta has to get smaller. Right? And since theta is only between 0 and 90 degrees, it's straight on or vertical, it's kind of a limit, then sine of theta getting smaller means that theta has to get smaller in that region. That's what happens with sine. So that is to say that when the slit width gets larger, the peak, the central peak, gets narrower. Or the opposite way, if you uh, narrow down the slit width, then the width of the central peak is going to expand, it's going to blow up. And this is kind of, I mean, kind of makes sense. If you're expanding the width of the slit, eventually you're going to get to the, you kind of pass a limit at some point where the slit width is just so much larger than the wavelength of the light that there's barely any diffraction happening anymore. And all you'd see on the screen is basically just the central uh, peak, right? And the fact that the width of that central peak gets larger as you can find the place that slit, you can find the area that the light can go through, somewhat uh, hints in a way at Heisenberg's uncertainty principle in that when you try to confine where the light is, right, you know it's going to go through this really tiny spot, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle says that now I've lost, in, I've sort of lost information about where it's all going. So you really can find where it is at this point, you sort of blow up where, where it's going to be, where it's going to end up later on. One way of thinking about it. We'll talk about that more in the chapters on quantum mechanics. That was a pretty deep look at the intensity due to single slit diffraction. And now we're just going to look at kind of some of the consequences of that a little bit more. One of those is that when we were thinking about the double slit, right, that's actually just, well, it's two slits, right? So each one of those slits has actually diffraction happening from it too. It's not just the interference of like a single ray from each of those slits. There's diffraction in each of those slits and it's an interference of those diffraction patterns. That is to say that our understanding of the double slits is sort of incomplete because we only thought about the interference pattern. And this picture is showing the interference pattern from two slits and that's sort of the lighter you know, purplish line, right? Pretty even pattern, especially close to the center of the screen. But the diffraction pattern has this uh, pretty large difference where it goes from this central maximum, it's really bright, and then uh, the next ones are much, much dimmer. So then when we're thinking about the double slit, throw the diffraction on top of it, it's essentially just a multiplication of the two intensities that we're thinking of with the double slit by itself and the diffraction by itself kind of multiply those two together, and that's the overall effect that we get. So the graph here is showing that if you multiply both of these, the interference and the diffraction, you can sort of look at it as like the diffraction is kind of modulating the interference pattern. The central bright spot is as bright as it's going to be because it's, it's a bright constructive spot for both diffraction and interference. But then if we look off at the first bright fringe, m equals 1, the interference of the, for just the double slit right, might be up here, but the intensity from the dis diffraction pattern is dropped down. So it kind of pulls that intensity overall down, and we get you know, a less intense uh, first bright fringe. Similarly, for the second bright fringe, m equals 2, right, with just the interference, it would have been up here, but the diffraction is modulating that and pulling that all the way down. So instead of getting these nice, even, bright fringes from the double slit interference, we're getting this overall sort of envelope that's modulating that interference due to diffraction. And when you look at m equals 3, 
the third order right fringe for interference is actually the first, actually occurs at the same location as the first dark fringe for diffraction. So while the double slit might say your, your right fringe is right here, you know, right, it's all the way up here for m equals three, the diffraction has a minimum. So multiply those two together, you get nothing. So this is what we would call, or what's called a missing order, where with the double slit itself, you would have had a bright fringe there, but the diffraction was taken that away. And this is just back to the picture that you've seen before of the double slit interference pattern, which if you're paying close attention, you might now realize that I was actually mistaken when I mentioned something about this pattern. So in the interference chapter, I showed you this pattern and I actually mistakenly was thinking that the large changes, right, this, you have this big central band and then these dark bands around here. I was thinking that that was the double slit interference. And then these tiny little bright bands was diffraction. I said we'd talk about that later. Surprise, I was mistaken. The tiny bright and dark bands, that's actually the double slit interference, right? And this overall pattern, where you have this big bright central one, and that dips down and you have these dimmer off-center fringes, that's the diffraction. All right, how about another example? So suppose that we have um, set up, you know, double slit set up, the slit widths are 0 0.02 millimeters and are separated by a distance of 0 0.2 meters. So if they're illuminated by monochromatic light, wavelength 500 nanometers, how many bright fringes are observed in the central peak of the diffraction pattern? So the picture on the left is just thinking about the double slit experiment. And in fact, relatively speaking, that picture would be much more uh, condensed or pushed, squished down. Right? Those, those peaks in the interference pattern are much closer together. So we're, now we're just sort of combining both of those things. So if we want to know how many bright fringes there are within the central maximum, well, we got to know where that uh, central maximum ends, and then we can figure out uh, what's the highest order from the double slit interference pattern that fits in there. So we're looking at the first order minimum for diffraction. So the angle of that first order minimum M equals one, so this is just lambda over A. And 500 nanometers is five times 10 to the minus seventh meters. Uh, the slit width was 0 0.02 millimeters or two times 10 to the minus five meters. That gives us 0 0.025 radians. And as you might note, the book notes this, this is a very small angle. Um, so it turns out that for our purposes here, sine of theta is really very close and essentially equal to theta. We'll just use theta instead of sine of theta going forward here. So this is the angle of from the center to the first minimums. Right? So how many interference right fringes are going to fit into that? So now we're thinking about the interference. And for maximums, remember that was, this was our condition for constructive interference in the double slit setup. solving for the number of fringes, and again, saying sine of theta is essentially just theta here. And at that angle, what's the interference order? Essentially what we're finding. Oh, we're running out of room. Zero, two, five radians. Turns out that comes up to a very nice round number, 10, right? So what this is telling us is that the 10th 
bright fringe and the double slit interference lines up exactly with the first dark fringe destructive uh, position in the diffraction pattern, meaning that the tenth bright fringe is not there. It's a missing order in this case. The interference pattern at this place has been canceled out by the diffraction minimum. So if you want to say how many are inside, well, it goes from uh, m being minus 9 to plus 9, right? 9 fringes below, 9 fringes above. And the center makes uh, 19? Yeah. 9 on either side and the center one. So that's 19 uh, double slit interference fringes within the central diffraction. Cool, so now you know a bit more about what happens when light goes through a slit, we get diffraction. In terms of applications, applicability, it turns out that one slit is not necessarily as useful of a thing, but if you have an instrument or an object and it has many, many slits in it, then it can become quite useful. That kind of object we call a diffraction gradient, and it can be anything really, but essentially just something with a bunch of slits in it, so just a bunch of slits. The diagram there showing like uh, grooves cut into a big glass or something. And what do you get, right? Essentially it's like now I'm thinking of overlapping multiple slits, many slits from like the young double slit picture, right? We talked a little bit about multi-slit, but now we have the idea of our understanding of diffraction from one slit and adding all those slits together. It's kind of complicated, but the basic point is that as the number of slits grows, the pattern, the diffraction pattern you get, you end up getting is essentially just one very, very bright central peak. And as the number of slits goes to infinity, that peak actually goes, the width goes to zero, and the peak kind of shoots to infinity. Um, not a very physical thing. So in uh, practical terms, you're getting kind of relatively close to having like an infinite-ish number of slits, you get a very bright, very narrow central peak, and then you get these other um, constructive peaks that are also very uh, narrow. So the picture here is showing laser light through a diffraction gradient, right? You have that very bright central peak, and then these other dimmer, but still very narrow off-center peaks. A lot of what we're talking about is what you call, technically call a transmission gradient. We're imagining light going through these slits. Um, there's another kind of diffraction gradient, which is a reflecting gradient, where you get the same kind of thing happening, or the same effect almost as if light went through a bunch of slits, where instead of light going through the material, you have a material that's kind of evenly bumpy in a way, like it has all these even steps, and so when light hits that, it um, reflects off in the same sort of way where the phase shift between each of these light rays that reflected off at these different angles, really different height along the gradient. The phase shift between those acts just like it would as if light went through uh, all these slits. So you can also have a reflecting gradient that does the same kind of thing. Right, and this is all just thinking about it in terms of monochromatic light, but in a second we'll look at, or just imagine, you know, what if it's not monochromatic light? What if it's white light that's like a range of visible light? Yes, and just looking a little bit more in detail at or in depth at this constructive, these constructive peaks. And so now our picture is we have many, many slits and light coming through these slits. And we can do the same thing. We think about all these different light rays there. And the difference in path length from say the top to the bottom, or bottom to the top, either way, you end up getting the same constructive condition as you would for the single slit where we're imagining the difference in path length from the top to the bottom. You end up getting the same, actually the same condition here, but now instead of the width of the single slit, it's in terms of the distance between each of these slits. You don't need to get, you need to bother yourself down too much about this, but just want to at least give you some slightly more in-depth look at it. The effect of all these slits, like I said before, is you imagine going from the single slit and when you add more and more slits, the effect is that each of these peaks in that pattern is getting narrower and sharper. Right, so what if you don't have monochromatic light? Well, that constructive condition depended on the wavelength of the light, right? So what that means is that these off 
center peaks. Right? You have white light coming through this diffraction gradient. The central peak is just going to be white. All the waves are still in phase there. The wavelength doesn't make a difference. But once you when you go to these off-center peaks, the wavelength makes a difference in that the constructive peak is going to be at a different angular position for the different colors, which ends up spreading out the white light, and you get rainbows. So there's a diagram I've shown here. There's actually a photograph of white light through a diffraction gradient. And the value given here is that there's 830 gradients, like slits per millimeter. So very, very fine slits. It turns out it's actually not, I don't know what the process is exactly, but according to the book, it's actually not that difficult to make diffraction gradient with a really, really fine distance between each slit. So this is actually another process that can disperse light, where you get dispersion. So just like, or not just like, but a different process that will do the same thing as the prism did. Right? The prism did that with refraction, that light, depending on its wavelength, refracted at different angles through material. It also diffracts through these gradients at different wavelengths, or depending on its wavelength. So that's why we also get this spread. And like I mentioned earlier, you can get diffraction not just through these gradients, not like this transmission gradient where light goes through these slits, you can get that same effect from reflection as long as you have this sort of regular pattern on the surface. For instance, with something like butterfly wings and some insect wings and this opal, right? there's a physical shape. When you look really closely at like these butterfly wings, it's almost like slats on the roof. Right? But these slats are incredibly tiny. They're around the size of the wavelength of light. Right? So meaning that we're able to get diffraction happening from this surface. And when the light reflects off, it's going to diffract. And that diffraction is going to cause this pattern where only certain wavelengths are constructed. So that's why the butterfly's wings look that color, even though they don't actually have pigment in them. Right? A lot of the times when you're seeing color, you're seeing it because there's actually like a pigment in that material. With these genes, blue, because there's actually some bit of material that is blue in there, and it absorbs all other wavelengths except the blue, and the blue is reflected. In this case, this is what we call uh, iridescence, where it's not colored because of pigment, it's colored because of the physical geometric shapes of these materials. Let's do a little example then having to do with these diffraction gradients. So if you have a diffraction gradient and it has, say, 10,000 lines per centimeter, you send white light through this diffraction gradient. Sorry, sometimes I'll say gradient. It's technically it's gradient, diffraction gradient. I don't know why I want to say gradient. But if you send white light through this gradient uh, to a screen that's two meters away, you want to find the angles of the first order constructive interference in that diffraction for the shortest and the longest wavelength of visible light. They tell us that those they tell us those wavelengths. And then, well what's the distance between those wavelengths then on the screen? Alright, well remember that just a slide or two ago that constructive condition for our diffraction gradient and there I said again for our diffraction gradient is the slit width or sorry not the slit width anymore. This is the distance between slits in the grating, and then the angle from the screen, the order, and the wavelength of the light. In this case, they don't tell us the slit, the distance between slits right away, but they tell us that there are 10,000 um, slits per centimeter. So divide centimeter by 10,000. Uh, one times 10 to the minus 6, that's our slit the distance between slits. And this is the first order maximum for the first order uh, constructive fringe here. So M is going to be 1. And just solve this for our angle. Let's first look at the angle that the violet light is going to be at. Need um, the wavelength of the violet light, 300 and 80 nanometers, or 3.8 is 10 to the minus 7 meters, divided by that uh, distance between the slits. That gives us 
three degrees, 22.3 degrees, 22, about 22 degrees. For the red light, exact same thing, just the wavelength is different than 49.46 degrees. So this is a spread of, what is that, about 27 degrees, pretty, fairly widespread. And then in part B, this was A, part B, we're asked to say what's the vertical distance between these colors. Okay. Well, we can just look at this, it's like these triangles, where this is that angle, that's the Y, and uh, we know this distance from the grading to the screen. So the tangent of that angle is going to be Y over the distance. Or y is that distance to the screen multiplied by tangent of the angle that we're interested in, the angle that we got for each of these. That would tell us the violet light is going to be at a vertical position of 2 meters times tangent. That's 0.815 meters. And then the red light, same thing, just that different angle with the red light is 2.3, about 2.34 meters. Pretty big difference. The difference between those distances is 1.52 meters. It's 1.5 meters, something like that. Pretty large. Maybe that's too large, but 1.5 meters. So this is. Uh, actually, a useful thing about diffraction gratings is if you have light, uh, multiple wavelengths of light, diffraction gradient allows you to spread that light out, right? You're interested in like examining the uh, fine details of that spectrum, then you want to be able to spread out and you can see the finer details. One useful thing for diffraction gratings. Thinking back for a second, in the chapter on optics, we spent a lot of time thinking about light going through lenses, looking at the light that's going through this kind of circular opening. The lens is a circular opening. But now that we understand that diffraction is a thing, that will cause trouble when you're trying to look at objects through these circular apertures, right? because the light from that object is going to diffract through that opening, and you'll get these fringes around the object or the image of that object, right? which might blur the image a bit and will cause difficulties in resolving that image. One of those difficulties is, strictly speaking, is resolving two different objects. So can I distinguish between two objects? The pictures here are showing that, you know, if I have one object in A, they're kind of looking through some sort of aperture, one object, fair enough, it has this diffraction going on, right? If there's two objects and they're pretty close together, I can still sort of distinguish that there's two objects there. Right? There's not, there's still far enough apart. The diffraction is blurring that, the sharpness of that, but I can still tell. Right? They go a little bit closer together, though, and you have this picture where it's almost, almost can't even really say for sure that there's two different things there. Right? They're overlapping close enough, and diffraction is spreading out the, um, the image of them enough that we're not sure there's even two things anymore. So this is something you might call like a resolving power. Okay, so we say objects are too close together, that's pretty uh, qualitative. How are we going to be exact about how close objects can be and we can still tell if there's two objects there? Right? What's, how do we quantify our resolving power? One way of doing that is, or one very well accepted way of doing that is what's known as the uh, Rayleigh, Rayleigh? Rayleigh? Uh, yeah, something like that. It's this criterion that essentially just relates it to the width of the central peak of the diffraction pattern for each object. So the diffraction limit to the resolution is that the two images are just resolvable, just distinguishable, when the center of the diffraction pattern of one is directly over the first minimum of the diffraction pattern of the other. And that's what the image is showing up there. Right? The intensities that it's pointing to, these are the two diffraction patterns from these two objects. And when the peak of one is just over the minimum of the other, that's the limit. That's as far as we can get, and anything more, they're not resolvable anymore.
So it's not too difficult to translate that verbal condition into this mathematical condition that the angle between these objects has to be equal to or above this 1.2 times the wavelength of light divided by the diameter of the aperture. And to be very clear that this D is not distance to the screen, I think if we have a big D distance to the screen, it's diameter of the aperture. It's a little bit unfortunate that some variables are used many times for different things in this area, but just got to keep in mind what you're dealing with and remember which, or look up what it, variables mean in that area. So this, this limit is assuming that the diameter is much greater than the wavelength of the light, which is generally, it's fine, it's generally true for most apertures we're interested in, part of our eyes, cameras, telescopes, microscopes, yeah, that kind of stuff. Um, an interesting side note is that actually this limit was thought to just be, you know, you couldn't overcome this. So there's no way to do this. It's physically impossible. And, well, science being science, some people figured out you could get around it. You sort of get around it by actually having the things that you're looking at emit light at wavelengths. You can kind of control the light, uh, the wavelength, the light that they're emitting. It's a process called controlled fluorescence that got these um, scientists uh, the 2014 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Is that Betzig and Farm for uh, like this like super resolved controlled fluorescence? Something other. Pretty cool. If we don't have that probably very difficult method of controlled fluorescence to implement, we're still going to imagine that our limit is that really, really limit. So let's try an example of having to do with that. Right? Let's have to see, particularly with the Hubble telescope. Nice cool picture from Hubble. So the Hubble tel telescope, its primary mirror has a diameter of 2.4 meters. So the question here is what is the angle between two just resolvable point light sources, like two stars, say very far away, assuming that the average wavelength of light is 550 nanometers. So the just put down what we know, diameter, 2.4 meters, wavelength of the light that we're talking about going through this di uh, this aperture, 550 nanometers. So the Rayleigh criterion tells us that the smallest angle that they can resolve is going to be 1.22 times the ratio of these values. Two point eight times ten to the minus seven radians. Very small angle. That's like a, about fifty thousandths of a degree. Very small. So then in part B, if the two stars that are looking at these point light sources are located two million light years from Hubble which is about the distance to Andromeda, the nearest galaxy to us, how close together can they be and still be resolved? So then, this is A, in B, we're gonna need, um, well, sort of have, you know, Hubble is here, it's got its objective, we have these two here, so the distance between them is, we can find as the arc length. Arc length. That arc length S is going to be uh, equal to angle between them multiplied by the radius. The radius of that arc. Which, they told us, is 2 million light years. Two times ten to the sixth light years, and oh, I guess I switched the ordering of those. Two point eight times ten to my seventh uh, radians. That comes out to 0.56 light years, about a little more than half a light year, which is probably not a coincidence. It was probably designed in this way. But um, 
most stars in a galaxy, like ours, like Andromeda, you know, standard spiral galaxy, most of the stars in that galaxy are farther, or at least half a light year apart. Towards the edges of the galaxy, they're further apart. Towards the center of the galaxy, they're really closer together. But for the most part, there's not. Most of them are going to be greater than half a light year apart, meaning that Hubble can actually resolve most of the stars in the Andromeda galaxy. Kind of crazy to think about because it's two million light years away. So another kind of telescope maybe look at just real quick is a radio telescope where you're using not visible light but radio waves. You're collecting radio waves in that aperture. And this is a telescope, Arecibo. I think it actually had a catch dog failure in the last couple of years. I'm not entirely sure. You might also recognize it from Goldeneye. Uh, anyway, it is a radio telescope with incredibly large aperture. It's 305 meter aperture. So with that aperture, well, It doesn't say here, but I think in the book it gives you maybe a rough estimate for the wavelength of radio waves. There actually is a very large spread, but just take, uh, say, one wavelength of radio waves of about 0.21 meters. Very large compared to visible wavelengths, right? This is a wave, or the wavelength, uh, 0.2 meters, maybe about that large, right? Whereas visible light is nanometers, hundreds of nanometers. So even though it's a very large diameter, much larger than Hubble, the fact that the wavelengths that are interested in are so large, or so much larger than visible light, means that our resolving power comes out to only 0.000689 radians, or uh, 6, about, about 7 times 10 to the minus 4 radians. Right, which is a thousand times less than Hubble. Radio waves actually can be very useful though, so even though it's like the resolving power isn't as great, you can do things with radio waves that light, visible light, uh, or the visible part of the flush magnetic spectrum just isn't very good for. So it's still very useful. So like I said, this uh, resolving power issue, the fact that you, know, you can only have optics so close together where you can't distinguish between them, uh, affects the resolution of microscopes too. If you think about light coming from, say, two different objects that are separated by this distance x, then the angle between those objects is going to be limited by this resolving power. And, well, it's pretty straightforward that the uh, d is like sort of the um, radius, and x is this kind of arc here, so that the radius d multiplied by theta, the angle between them, is going to be equal to x, that's for your arc length relationship, meaning that theta is going to be equal to that distance x divided by the distance from the lens to the objects, which means that x divided by d is going to be equal to that Rayleigh limit, the criterion 1.22 times lambda over d. Or if we want that, think about that just in terms of x, But in terms of microscopes, usually I, or people usually talk about it in a different way, whereas where they think of the amount, the maximum amount of light from an object that's going to enter a lens, right, having to do with something called the numerical aperture of a microscope. So we get this kind of picture where we're thinking about light coming from a single source and sort of the limits the furthest or the widest uh, spread in light that's going to still get into the lens of the microscope. So that length, that angle, unfortunately, also labeled theta. It's a different theta from the last one. This is the acceptance angle. But if we look at just half that angle, alpha, then the numerical aperture, this NA, is defined as the um, index of refraction of that lens, the material of that lens, multiplied by sine of that, that alpha, half the acceptance angle. So we can relate that then to our resolving power, or back to that x, the distance between these objects, by looking at, say, sine of that angle alpha, 
So sine of that angle alpha is going to be one equal to one half d divided by or big D divided by the little d. The little d is essentially is the hypotenuse. It's also essentially the um, adjacent angle. These are small angles we're dealing with, so those are basically the same thing. So we could write it as that, or big D over two little D, which means that that distance from the lens to the object divided by the diameter of the lens is equal to one over two sine alpha. That means we can say that distance between objects, we're looking at two objects, remember this is like the limit of object, how close objects could be. That's what that x me was measuring. 1.22, place the ratio of d, little d over big D. And then finally pull in that definition of numerical aperture. Replace that sine of alpha with n over n a over little n, since it's in the denominator. Look at that. Uh, I'm missing a two here. Sorry. So that becomes point, like uh, 0.61, right? As it was shown up here. So this is relating now the Right, the distance between objects that are just resolvable to this quantity that we wanted or that's used in microscopes called the numerical aperture. That resolving power, the distance, sort of sort of the distance between those two objects that are just resolvable, x is inversely proportional to this quantity of numerical aperture. Meaning that the larger numerical aperture for a microscope, the more powerful the resolution is, like the, the closer, the finer kind of things you can see. And here, another result of diffraction is, well, we have to rethink about this concept of a focal point. When we were thinking about lenses and spherical mirrors too, we were thinking about light either reflecting or um, refracting through an object and focusing down to a single point. But now if we think about it in terms of like the lens and the fact that it can only resolve objects that are so close, also implies that it can only actually focus light down to a certain space, not a point anymore. Right? Diffraction is sort of spreading that focal point out a little bit. So instead of a focal point, you actually get this focal region or a focal kind of space. Right? It can be fairly very small in, in practical purposes, almost a point, but diffraction means it never actually gets to be a point. And in terms of the numerical aperture, a larger numerical aperture is going to mean that focal point is closer to being an actual point, as opposed to a spread out region. Remember, we're just talking about kind of problems that diffraction causes. A very useful application of diffraction is what's known as x-ray diffraction, where you use x-rays as the kind of light that you're passing through something, and the x-rays will go through material and diffract in the material. And well, if you have a screen that's sensitive to x-rays, then you can get these sort of photographs of this diffraction pattern from the x-rays. One of the main reasons why that is so useful is because x-rays can be much smaller than visible light. Right? The wavelength of x-rays ranges anywhere from like 10 to 10,000 times smaller than visible wavelengths, which means that the scale of things that you can look at is much, much smaller too. So on the left, there's a picture, a picture, a photograph of an actual diffraction pattern, x-ray diffraction pattern. Um, I believe that middle sort of line is actually in the picture there, or in the diagram, the x-rays are going through. Most of, a lot of that is diffracted and sent to these uh, angles depending on what the uh, material, or how the material is arranged. But there's also still this central one, the sign of central peak that keeps going through. I think that's what that bright middle uh, sort of line is, white line. And just briefly, we're not going to get too much into x-ray diffraction. It can be a very complicated thing. But one sort of simple way of looking at it is when you're sending x-rays into a material like a crystal, and crystal is arranged, it's these atoms or molecules that are arranged in these nice little rows maybe. And if we just look at say like a 
imagine like a slice of some object, then a crystal, then we just have these you know, points where x-rays can diffract off of, right? And the points are regular, regularly spaced. And if you look at, say, the two light rays in that diagram, the top one would uh, reflect off of one point A, the bottom one travels a little bit further, reflects off of B, that's just below A, goes out. And you can hopefully convince yourself it's pretty straightforward to see that the difference in distance or the additional distance that that bottom ray travels is twice D, the distance between those points, multiplied by the sine of theta. So be careful here, theta, we're talking about refraction, or sorry, reflection, but theta in this picture is the angle from the horizontal to that incoming ray. So in reflection before, theta was the angle from the normal line. But the way that this is historically been put, measure theta from the horizontal, from kind of the surface of the material. Given that information, it turns out that the constructive condition for these x-rays that are diffracting off of this crystal is going to be that difference in distance is some multiple of the wavelength. This is known as the Bragg equation or Bragg's law, but that's just like a simple kind of pass at x-ray diffraction, right? Because if you think about it, these crystals, you know, this is one plane of a crystal maybe, and so the crystal is actually three-dimensional, and when x-rays are coming through, they can hit at all kinds of angles in this crystal, and so there's sort of like these, you have to imagine them like these planes uh, that the x-rays um, coming in perpendicular onto, right? There's all these different planes in a crystal. And it's true that the crystal is not always a, as even as that, right? Crystals have, there's different crystalline structures. So the diffraction pattern can be very complex and it takes a lot of analysis to figure out what's going on there. One very famous x-ray diffraction photo though is this one up here, which is x-ray diffraction of DNA. This image was created by Franklin so the, the fact that the x-rays are diffracting in these diagonal patterns is indicating that uh, DNA actually has this helix structure. Hel hel helixical? It's a helix, double helix actually. And this was one of the key pieces of evidence in showing that DNA um, does have this double helix structure. Right, and then the very last thing, not really going to go into it much at all, but it's in the chapter, I just wanted to mention it is something called holography, where it's the creation of uh, holograms. So things like, you know, that's the hologram maybe on the uh, credit card, but, you know, holograms are also used in, uh, sometimes in money. Uh, you actually you can use holograms uh, to store information. Yeah, I'm doing money because they're hard to reproduce, so it's a way to fight counterfeiting. But like I said, we're not gonna go too much into it. It's, it can be very, very complicated. A really simple way to think about it, though, at least, is shown in this picture here, where you have this object that you want to create a hologram of, apparently like a T-Rex or something, and you essentially shine coherent light on that object, right, or you know, send coherent light towards that object, and part of that uh, light, you bounce off of this mirror, so it doesn't hit the object at all, it just goes to the um, photosensitive plate here. The other part of that light actually comes and hits the object, will reflect and diffract off of this object, and some of that light that reflects and diffracts eventually going to hit that photo plate too. And so what happens is you still have this coherent light coming in, and then you have this light that's been diffracted at all these crazy angles, and they come together and they form their own interference pattern. So in a sense, what you're photographing in this case is the interference pattern. It's a dis this diffraction uh, pattern and the interference of that with the light that just bounced off the mirror straight. The result being, when you look at a hologram and you're looking at it from different angles, you're at the information that's recorded on there is a diffraction and interference at different angles. So you change the angle that you're looking at it, you're seeing the diffraction pattern from a different angle, which is why it looks like, it gives the impression of that being a three-dimensional image. Right, so that's it for chapter four, diffraction, which is also it for part one of the course. After the exam, we're going to go on and look into first into electromagnetic waves, uh, which will kind of get us towards modern physics. So I'm not sure where we go exactly, but relativity, uh, 
quantum mechanics, eventually cosmology, all that good stuff. So I will see you later.